All right, tie. Tie, 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 tie. I love life, Ty. I love this sport. I love this night. I love this conversation. I love these games. Save for one. Save for one of those games I didn't love. But I'm here. I'm present. I'm ready to talk. You ready to do this? I am ready to do this. Uh, welcome one and all to the Midnight Reaction stream. We have much to react to. College Football Championship Week is officially in the books. Um, hit subscribe if you have yet to do so on the YouTube channel. Make sure you also go to the links that are at the bottom of this video and follow the podcast as well. It is going to be a very busy few days. Just saying. Uh, we would appreciate that if you've already done so. Uh, leave star ratings, leave reviews, hit the yes. like button on the video. You know the drill by now, but all that stuff helps us out. Yes. Without further ado, Dan, um, I think we should get started with yes. what is likely to be a rather eventful conversation. Floor is yours. Let's do what we've been doing, folks. Help me count this guy in. Let's go in three, in two. College football championship week. Dan Rubenstein is officially in the books. And my friend, we have much to discuss. How are you this evening? I'm great. I have so many thoughts that will be used against me in a court of law. Uh, much like my Pac-12 <laughs> championship prediction has been used against. It's okay. It's all okay. I'm very excited to talk about. We had a number of super fun, weird, crazy uh, intriguing games and results, and there's all sorts of meaning to dissect from all of it. Ty, I cannot. Let's just let's just jump as quickly as we humanly can, as as quickly as we can. I think that's the way to go, man. Uh, please hit subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast. Please make sure you rate, give star reviews, and 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 whatever you can. Look, we've got a lot to get through. It's going to be a very very busy week of college football. We had a very bizarre set of circumstances unfold this weekend. I don't know if we fully saw coming what ended up happening. And the playoff committee clearly has some interesting things to discuss. Yes. After which we will get into here over the next hour or so. Um, this is effectively part one of what's going to be a prolonged reaction series from Dan and I. We are recording this at midnight Saturday after... The nightcaps after the Louisville game, after the Michigan Iowa game, um, the committee's got to make its selections here in a matter of hours. So we will, of course, update those <laughs> when we can as part of the Tuesday podcast episode. We'll do a live reaction for those of you who are catching this episode early. We'll do that out on YouTube shortly after the playoff pairings are announced. But being so, this is the campfire. Let's start the fire, man. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> So we'll start in chronological order. I don't think that's like the move per se. I think we should start in chronological order. Because we can do one of those like Marvel Pac-12 championship recaps after the credits. Is that what we can do? <laughs> one of those just a, it's only the real people know. <laughs> okay, Dan, whatever you want, Ty. Don't cry because no, the Pac-12's over. Ugh, that does smile, suck. smile because the Washington Huskies happened. Yeah. Smile because it happened because Washington... Among all of the uncertainty that we're going to discuss here this evening, Washington is absolutely going to the college football playoff. 13-0, and 0, uh, they beat your Oregon Ducks by a 34-31 score. They are undefeated in the last ever season of the Pac-12. They got a great win on Friday night in Vegas, and they're going to the ship, man. They're playing for the ship. Yeah, they're going to the playoff, yeah. And we both were wrong. Uh, we both said that we thought Oregon was going to win this game. You were a little bit more confident about it than True. I was. I at least had Washington plus the number. You felt pretty adamantly that Oregon had enough momentum going into this game that these were essentially ships passing in the middle of the night. True. Washington going in one direction, Oregon going in another. And we talked a lot about vibes on the preview episode, the killer instinct vibes, the close win vibes, like all of these factors that we considered and we came out with Oregon as our eventual straight-up winner. And uh, what happened? 
Well, first of all, you nailed it that Washington Washington went 13 and 0 for a reason. They're a very very good team. And you know, we talked about I specifically talked about how I thought it was an advantageous moment for Oregon given the close calls. Washington with however many straight games within with single digit wins for a team to to be this successful. I think it was nine straight eight? something crazy, eight yeah, straight. Eight. Yep. Whatever that number is. And okay, specific to this game, Washington came out making plays on offense. They came out moving the ball. They came out running the ball. They came out looking like the clear, more complete team in this game, which they proved themselves to be over the course of four quarters. You look at what Dylan Johnson was able to do. You look at what Michael Penix was largely able to do in this game. I mean, he had an incredible number of absolute dimes, absolute perfect passes, which he's shown over the course of the year, but seemed to be slowing down over the back half of the season. You know, after that USC game, whether it was against ASU, whether it was against Oregon State, whether it was against Wazoo, it seemed like the way Oregon had progressed on defense and the way Washington had been playing down to opponents. And maybe Washington just is what their opponents are. And they're just gamers and they can do enough to win. They have a coach who has exclusively won everywhere he's been, especially as a head coach. And so what Washington was able to do, they were able to neutralize Oregon up front, the Washington offensive line. They were able to get a ton from an injured, by the way, Dylan Johnson on the ground, and then a healthy Jalen McMillan who didn't play uh, against Oregon. I don't even think he suited up against Oregon in that first matchup. So you have two, if not three, killer receiving options for Washington out wide, which they didn't have that first matchup. And they jump out to a very comfortable commanding lead. Oregon goes three and out three of their first four drives, I believe. You can fact check me on that. I think it was a field goal was the one that was sandwiched in there. And you can't do that against an offense that's operating. And no. so what Oregon wasn't able to do, they were not able to establish the run really at any point in the game. A couple longer runs, one big one from Bo Nix. But the story of this game was how complete Washington was. Washington rose to a bunch of big moments, especially in the red zone. Oregon rose to a bunch of big moments as well. Made this a game. Absolutely, Oregon won that middle eight, right? They score right before halftime. They score right at coming out of halftime. And I think at that point, it's 20 to 17. There are weird plays on Oregon's side, right? A, a DB for Washington falling out of bounds and then jumping back in towns in the perfect moment to intercept a Bo Nix pass. And then you have a reviewed Michael Penix. Is his arm coming forward? Is it not? On a fumbled call on the field, and then it's reversed as I think his arm was slightly coming forward. So it, it was the right call, but, you know, a millisecond the other direction. It's Oregon up four with the ball in the fourth quarter. Washington played more plays, made more plays. Washington was and is the better team. They beat this Oregon team twice this year. Yeah. There's not much of a hill I can stand on at this point, as confident <laughs> as I was going into this game. Washington, on a neutral field, after playing a couple of down games, came out more prepared, more ready, and is absolutely the team between these two teams that uh, has established itself to be of playoff caliber. And the way they close out this game, right, that, you know, it's Oregon goes down the field to get within three. They need a stop with a couple minutes left. Washington closes it out. Oregon has those opportunities to get stops and close this game out up in the fourth quarter, and they don't do it. Washington has the opportunity to do it just like they did the first time around, and they got it done. Dan Lanning has now lost three straight to Washington, and until proven otherwise, and they're now going to be rivals at the end of the season in the Big Ten, Caleb DeBoer and Washington own this rivalry. And I, I have nothing but good things to say. And if you force me to pick this game again, I'd probably still pick Oregon. Well, because I'm I mean, stupid, Ty. Look, but Washington is the clear better team. Washington won this game in the trenches. Yeah. They won this game in the trenches. Their offensive front set the tone for Dylan Johnson, who ran for a buck 52 and two touchdowns, five and a half a carry. Uh, Washington was 10 of 15 on third downs. It just really struck me that. Oregon for its physicality, for all the physicality that we talked about with its defense, they yeah. couldn't get Washington off the field. No, they couldn't get him off the field. And you know, you look at the box score after the fact. I mean, it really did feel like Washington controlled the tempo of the game. They finished with 15 more minutes of possession. Yeah, than, than Oregon. And if you watched the game again, it really truly felt that way. Uh, I'll close with this. I mean, I think you pretty much and, summed and, it up. And part of that is Oregon did score quite quickly on a couple of sure. those touchdowns, which does affect things. Uh, Oregon also, and look, everybody's beat up. Everybody's dealing with injuries. That's why you build up depth. Oregon without one of its starting quarters, they lose a starting defensive lineman early in the game. Washington was without guys that first time they played. Everybody's beat up. Everybody's hurt. You got to make plays. Washington made more. 
Let, let me close with this because I think you did a pretty good summation of the game. Yeah. For all the talk about Michael Panix Jr. and how he's looked out of sync down the stretch, his shaky moments in this game were far outweighed by the dimes that you referenced earlier, whether it was yeah, to Jalen McMillan or Roma Dunze, Jalen Polk. Oregon hurried him 13 times in this game. They sacked him twice. They did generate some pressure, but they only forced one punt the entire game. Washington had a really good scheme, a really good game plan coming into this one. And I think like what excites me the most now in this reality where Washington is going to play in the playoff against somebody. And we're going to talk about that momentarily. I promise we're going to see a true contrast in style. Washington is going to be a different team than almost anybody else in the college football playoff and how their offense holds up against what figures to be some very, very good defenses that they've got in front of them, I think will be extremely interesting to watch. Should so, also, yeah. Kudos to the Washington Huskies for punching their ticket to the final college football playoff, the final four team college football playoff. Should mention the game winning touchdown for Washington. Uh, was the play in which I think this is their third string tight end, Quentin Moore, shows block, leaks out for like a two-yard little touch pass. 100% success rate in football. (laughs) When your tight end shows block and then leaks out 100% of the time, and I'm always screaming about this as an Oregon human for Oregon to run this play, good for Washington for running it in that moment. Of course it was going to work, and it did. It did. So with that being said, we know one team that's going to be in it. We know another. We know Michigan is going to be in that college football playoff. Michigan won 26 to nil over Iowa. By the way, hit the big blowout parlay of Iowa scoring less than 0.5 points in the first half, less than 10 and a half points overall, and Michigan winning by a specific margin between 25 and 30 points. I felt very proud of myself. Congratulations. Six to one parlay. Fewer than a half a point is some number. That's great. I mean, the real winners here beyond Michigan were those who went to X golf in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, where they were offering free draft beer until Iowa scored. Oh, that is three hours of hard drinking. My friends taking yeah. place in Cedar Rapids. Hope everybody got home. Safely. Yeah, I was going to say, hope that the DDs out there are doing their jobs. Look, Uber Iowa drivers gained, everywhere. Iowa gained 149 yards. Michigan only gained 212 yards. Uh, This is not exactly a stellar offensive showing for the Michigan Wolverines. They did what they had to do. I'm not splitting hairs too much with what Michigan did, but we talked it through before we hit record. They had touchdown drives of what, like five and six yards. Yeah. It wasn't the most impressive performance and not that anybody's had truly impressive performances beyond your Penn State Nittany Lions on offense. And even then Drew Allard didn't do much. He just didn't make mistakes. They, that was 31, nothing. I want to say 30, nothing. Yeah. So obviously the class of the big 10 conference at this point via what you did against Iowa is yeah. we are Penn state. Um, yeah, no touchdown drives for Michigan in the big 10 championship game, but you win a game 26, nothing. I don't know. You do what you got to do to get there. That's fine. I'm, I'm perfectly content with the matchup. I'm perfectly content with, uh, what we saw from Michigan. Obviously the Michigan Wolverines are going to be playing for this thing. I don't know if there's a whole lot more to offer on the Michigan, Iowa game. We sort of knew what we were getting when we saw the matchup break. Michigan yes. wins, Michigan covers. It was a very frightful game of Iowa offense, try as they might. Still have the defense. It'll be interesting to see what they do in bowl season, depending on the matchup. But then things start getting interesting, Dan. <laughs> we know for sure two of the teams in the college football playoff. We know Washington. We know Michigan. It would be kind of cool if they played in the Rose Bowl. By the way, is there any other Michigan thoughts about just who they are, what they were able to accomplish against Iowa, anything that is at all concerning to you about Michigan, anything that you take as a big positive from this matchup just as they head into the playoff? I mean, look, we uh, again, we knew what we were getting with this matchup. We knew it was going to be this kind of game. I think if you really want to split hairs, you would have liked to have seen more offensive output. You would like to have seen them not um, struggle at times offensively. Yeah, in the second against, half. And, and there's a reason why teams struggle against Iowa. This is an excellent defense. It's a very good defense, but I, I'm i just I'm just not going to go there with, with Michigan. I mean, they have been solid okay. all year. Michigan, you could argue, has faced, and this you're going to probably make fun of me for saying this, they have faced more adversity. They've certainly faced more unique challenges than almost any team in the country, and they have emerged 13-0 and 
<laughs> and challenges conference okay. champion. It's yeah, an interesting it's, way of putting it. I mean, look, they, they didn't they didn't have Iowa's defensive calls tonight. If they did, they did a, a nice job hiding it and playing coy and not not going too far with it. But okay, fair enough. That brings us to the conversation that everybody is interested in. Yeah. Who are the final two teams that get into the college football playoff? Um, this conversation was kicked into high gear by virtue of Alabama knocking off Georgia 27-24 in the SEC title game. It was a good game. We did a live stream. We had a ton of people watching. We appreciate everybody stopping on by. Um, we can talk about this game. Yeah. Texas. Texas won in resounding fashion. They needed to because the college football playoff selection committee had them ranked seventh coming into the week. Texas won 49 to 21 over Oklahoma state truly in a game that didn't, it never felt close. It was just never close. Oklahoma state had zero answers for anything that Texas wanted to do. That game was a runaway train. And then this evening, as we come on the air, the Florida state Louisville game just finished up. Florida state won that. 16 to 6. Florida State was starting their third string quarterback, Brock Glenn, because Tate Rodemaker was concussed on that hit that occurred towards the end of the Florida game a week ago. A standout, stellar defensive performance from the Knowles. They hold down Louisville. They force some key mistakes, notably a Jack Plummer uh, interception in the end zone that could have given Louisville, well, could have almost two Jack Plummer interceptions in the end zone. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it truly was a Jack the Plumber type performance. Um, but we now find ourselves in this pickle of folks arguing left, right, and forward about who of those three winners should make it into the college football playoff. Why don't we start with the Bama-Georgia game, though, because that's really what kicked this conversation off. Yes. This was an evenly matched defensive slugfest almost the full way through. And Georgia committed by my count the two biggest mistakes in the game which was a doinked 50 yard field goal at uh, the after like a a nearly eight minute drive i want to say 13 play 750 somewhere in there and if you're taking that long to possess a ball and coming out with bup kiss you're absolutely right ty that is a humongous moment towards the end game. of the first half because that limits half. everybody's possessions yeah they doink one off the pole, and then there was a the fumble in the third quarter. Bama scored a touchdown after the missed field goal. They scored a field goal after that fumble. So you could argue 10 points off, off Georgia mistakes, broadly speaking. But this was just a defensive slugfest. Neither team really had a whole lot going on offense. Georgia 4 of 12 on third downs. Bama just 3 of 13. The, the story for me was twofold, all right? Yeah. One, Georgia couldn't run the ball. They couldn't run the ball. They had three touchdowns on the ground. But it was two and a half a carry. And I thought Bama's ability to control the line of scrimmage, to lean on their secondary, to like manage the Georgia passing game, not stop it outright. They didn't stop it outright, but just managing it, not giving up monster plays, not not being sliced and diced through the air. That to me was the big difference because they were able to control that ground game. And secondly, it's Jalen Milrow, man. Yeah. I mean, he's a real problem. <laughs> He's a real problem. The numbers, if you didn't watch this game, if you're just looking at box scores and that sort of thing, the numbers aren't going to knock you over. But yeah, he's almost identical throwing the ball to Carson Beck. Yeah, he's clearly gotten better over the last three months. He's clearly gotten a lot more confident. He's formed a bond with Isaiah Bond out wide. They have figured out better ways to use him. They didn't use him as a runner. Interestingly enough, we talked about that in the preview. Not they too much. No, they didn't use him as a runner until very late in this game when they needed to ice it. And that's when he delivered. And so it's just a really interesting conversation to have about Alabama. I don't know how they fit into this playoff thing. Maybe you and I can parse that out, but the push pull of the power rushing attack with the deep ball and the vertical threat, and then Jalen Milrose's ability to run when they want him to run, that poses a real resource issue for a defense, right? Are you committing to the deep ball? Are you committing men up front in the box to stop the run? Jace McClellan didn't play in this game. He tweaked a foot a week ago. Um, so it's, it's a very curious defensive scheme that you have to run against this version of Alabama. And, and and you know Georgia Georgia did a good job for the most part, but either by virtue of those mistakes or by virtue of the fact they just couldn't get their own offense going, they ended up losing essentially at home in Atlanta 
by a 27 to 24 margin. I also think the difference in this game is Carson Beck is a good quarterback, but I don't think he's a playmaker on the level of where Stetson Bennett was. And if anything we saw from Jalen Milrow is he was a playmaker, right? When oh, yeah. it's the, the high leverage moments where they need to close out the game, he's rushing for nine on you know second and eight, whatever that was. Or the little shovel toss he had as the the Georgia defense is bearing down on him for another first down, right? That there's there's a little bit of pixie dust about Jalen Milrow where he is not the polished he's not the most polished quarterback. He does not have the best bond, as you said, with his receivers at all times and just like throwing the ball over the slot with perfect timing between a linebacker and safety. That's not who he is. He can go downfield and he had that really nice, I think it was Bama's first touchdown to put them up 10 7 to a, a running back on a wheel route. I don't know who was that uh who who was that caught that that ball? The running back out of the backfield on that first touchdown tie. Was on that Jam Miller? Uh, I have to check. I don't have it in front of I me. I think it was Jam Miller. Anyway, it was those kinds of plays, right, where he takes what the defense is giving, and he was terrific. He was the difference in this game. He and Alabama's secondary absolutely smothering Georgia's receivers, making them earn everything. I'm sure Georgia fans are infuriated that more flags weren't thrown, but it seemed to be even enough both ways that they were letting them play physical. And for your part about Milrow not really running or not choosing to run or not seeing the running lanes, Georgia did an outstanding job, especially early spying him um, and making sure that they had guys in lanes. And it came down to the fact that Alabama was able to finish drives and Georgia wasn't. And what this means for Alabama moving forward, sure, we're going to get to shortly. But I, I thought clearly... Alabama was ready for this game, especially at quarterback in a way that Georgia wasn't quite. Even though Carson Beck made plays, we saw the long pass to Arian Smith, fastest guy on the Georgia team. You have to Always. legally say that. You have to say that legally every time you mention And Brock name. Bowers certainly isn't at 100%, which affects things absolutely. But Alabama is slightly better than this Georgia team. And that came to pass. Georgia losing, and I cannot emphasize this enough. Yeah. Georgia losing throws the playoff conversation in a blender. It throws it in a absolute blender. And Florida State winning, yeah. <laughs> and Florida State winning. <laughs> but I think especially Georgia losing is, even though this point spread was only six or five and a half or five, wherever you got it at kickoff, even though it was fairly reasonable looking at that and and imagining a world in which Alabama could win, and we talked about it on our preview as well. Even though all that stuff was true, I don't know if we ever really thought it would happen. And the fact that it did now makes this a very, very interesting conversation. So Alabama wins the SEC. Meanwhile, the team that beat, the only team that beat Alabama this year, the Texas Longhorns, 49 to 21. At one point, I tweeted out from our solid verbal account that Texas was on pace for 84 points. If you watched the game, it felt that way, Dan. Yeah. It really felt that way. This was a situation where Oklahoma State could not cover Texas. They couldn't taxle, tackle Texas. They were getting blown off the ball by Texas. There was zero pressure on Quinn Ewers. He threw for 450 yards and four touchdowns. Greatest game in like the history of the Quinn Ewers regime. Uh, receivers were wide open by like five to ten yards with nobody around them. Texas needed to win impressively, and this game was essentially over before it started. At a moment in this game, I, I met, mentioned this to you, it felt like Oklahoma State was basically running the all-PI offense. They were just yeah. heaving the ball up, trying to get pass interference It was just calls. shots. It was the little John offense, right? It was shots, 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 shots. Yeah. It was, it was really, really frustrating uh, from an Oklahoma State standpoint, not so much from the Texas standpoint, because Texas did what they needed to do. Again, Texas resounding win here to win the Big 12. They beat Alabama. There's a case to be made that maybe Texas should be in this thing. And then the final team here of note that we need to discuss is Florida State. Florida State may be the most interesting bit in this whole conversation now. So Jordan Travis goes down a couple weeks ago. Tate Rodemaker comes in. They win the game on the road at Florida. Um, he gets concussed. We saw Brock Glenn in this game. It was not exactly a sparkling offensive showing for Florida State, but it was a standout defensive performance for the Yeah, Wolves. and to be They're, fair, had some drops. Brock had Glenn. some drops. Yep. Had some drops. I mean, I don't know how much you want to fault a guy making his first start in the ACC championship totally. game with a playoff bid on the line. 
Yes. Right. That's a high pressure situation. And, you know, I, I think all things considered, you, you kind of know what you're going to get there. Defensively, though, what Florida State did, I thought was really impressive. We we did our stream earlier when we were doing the SEC championship watch along. And you asked me, what's the margin of victory for Florida State in order for them to win and still get into the playoff amid all this uncertainty? Per per said, your brain, per, per your brain. needs and wants for them. Yeah. Per per my brain, per my needs and wants at the time as of like, you know, six o'clock this afternoon. And I said Florida State's got to win by ten. Florida State won by ten. They won by ten. Um, they came up huge in some big high leverage moments defensively. And so at least by that measure, they're a major conference champion. They're undefeated. A team like that has never been left out of the college football playoff. Right. Uh, they of course had the win back in week one over LSU. They knocked off Clemson. They've had some bumps in the road, but by and large, Florida state has been pretty much unscathed throughout the course of the season as evidenced by the record. So they've got as strong a case as anybody, probably a stronger case. If I'm being honest, than either of the other two, or you can even add three if you want to include Georgia, or four if you want to add Ohio State. Florida State's got it. I would think, presumably, Florida State's got it as an undefeated major conference champion. Yeah, I mean, it was it was incredible watching this performance from, was it Joe Tess and Jesse Palmer, host of yeah. The Bachelor, as they were sort of contorting themselves in like different directions, like, well, it's a quarterback-driven sport. And how do you do it without, you know, knowing what kind of quarterback play you're going to get from a playoff team? But, like, well, they went undefeated. Um, it's a Here, playoff caliber defense. Here is my question, though, okay? Yeah. Here is my question, and this is what I am really hung up on. Okay. Does this version of Florida State beat Alabama? Does this version of Florida State beat Michigan? Does this version of Florida State with the backup or the backup to the backup given its defense, beat any of the teams that I just mentioned. Any of these six or sure. 17, however many you want to include in that conversation, I don't care. It doesn't matter. Does this version of Florida State beat any of those teams in a playoff setting? May I quote the great Samuel Gerard, as played by Tommy Lee Jones in the terrific movie, The Fugitive? He's like, I didn't kill my wife. And Samuel Gerard says, I don't care. <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't care. And here's the thing. Does, does this version of Florida State, this version of Florida State isn't playing. It's going to be a Tate Rodemaker team in a month if we're talking about Florida State in the playoff, right? Sure. He's going to be back. It's not going to be a Brock Glenn team. Now, when you say that, when I say that, then you're crawling into a space of like, well, what is Tate Rodemaker Florida State? And were they the worst quarterback-led team that Florida played all year last year? Or offense? Maybe. Devin Leary and Kentucky weren't good, but otherwise, like, Vandy threw the ball better against Florida than Florida State did last week. So you get into the issue of, like, how much of a difference does looking forward make? How much of a difference of winning a Power 5 conference undefeated? Florida State could have lost. Texas did. Florida State could have lost. Alabama did. And so then you're you're getting in – you're looking at resumes. You're looking at performances – if Florida State wins this game with Jordan Travis at 17-6, are we having this conversation? Probably doesn't matter because they didn't, right? It's the old, like, if I had wheels, I'd be a bicycle. That's not the that. reality in which we live. You love that, yeah. I do love that. So Florida State absolutely looked like a playoff team on defense. So what does that mean if they were playing Washington? What does that mean if they're playing Michigan? Well, it means they could probably do what Iowa did <laughs> against Michigan, which is look really strong and force Michigan to be very uncomfortable and lose the game you know, 13 to six or something like that. I, I, I don't know how you leave Florida state out, but at the same time you could go reverse Tommy Lee Jones and say the committee shouldn't care. First of all, this is the committee is not going to have to make this kind of precedent making decision ever again. It's never going to be four teams again. So there's never going to be precedent for leaving out a power four as we move forward champion. So, I go back and forth with this. If you're asking me purely which four teams do I feel like could play at the highest level on New Year's Day, it's probably Michigan, Washington. This is no real particular order, but maybe it is. Michigan, Washington, Texas, Alabama. Hmm. Because I think Boo Corrigan specifically said that he doesn't care when a team beats a team. That's just the win. That's just what exists when, the, when we're categorizing these teams. And so then Texas wins a conference, loses one game, beats Alabama. 
by 10 on the road. They're ahead of Alabama. If you're asking me who the best teams are based on what they've done on the field, I really like teams that go undefeated. Yeah. <laughs> I really, really do. I think winning is harder than losing. And Florida State won more, much more than they lost, and they won more than the teams were comparing them against. We're including Alabama in this conversation because of what? Because of what SEC teams did in previous years? Right? This Alabama team hasn't been undeniable this year. Just like this Texas team hasn't been undeniable this year. Just like this Florida State team hasn't been undeniable. But we're giving Alabama this benefit of the doubt because they beat Georgia. They snuck by Auburn. They snuck by Arkansas. They snuck by Texas A&M. They snuck by USF. And if it doesn't matter when they played, it doesn't matter that it was week two or three, right? So I'm not sure that we should be automatically lumping Alabama in just because they're a part of the big bad SEC. So if you were to fast forward and tell me, I know I'm, I'm just sucking up all the air in this room. I apologize. No, go for it. If you were to tell me that the committee says one Michigan without a touchdown drive against Iowa, two Washington from the best conference in America, three Florida State, four Texas, I'd say, wow, that is surprising to me. I did not expect this. But also, kind of get it. Kind of get it. Kind of okay with it. it. There there are a couple different ends of this spectrum, Yeah, right? There is the Alabama should be in because they are the SEC conference champion. Mm-hmm. There is the Greg Sankey model, which is, well, look at how high quality our football is. We should put both Alabama and Georgia in. Yeah. You could probably make that case if you want. Georgia is a two-time defending champion. Maybe not with the schedule or the resume. Not with this team. Not, not with, with Carson team. Beck. They're not. Right. They they it, it's a harder case to make. He tried to make it. Yeah. And then on the, I guess, far extreme of that spectrum is what you just mentioned, leaving them out, leaving the SEC out entirely, sure. which which, of course, would be, you know, cataclysmic in some circles of college football. Yeah. Uh, and newsworthy at worst in others. So, yeah. I mean, it's an incredible conversation that I think the committee has to have. I, I really struggle, though, with, as you mentioned the dilemma between a team that won all of the games it was supposed to win in a power five conference, the on-field performance, essentially the resume versus trying to project forward because by every resume measure we have, Florida state deserves to be in that playoff. It doesn't matter who the quarterback is, yeah. right? A team is offense. A team is defense. A team is special teams. And when one side of that goes down, we see it all the time. We talk about half teams on this show yeah. until we're blue in the face. Beat when the best once, half team in America in LSU. When, yeah. when one side of that team goes down, the other has to pick it up. That's, totally. what, that's what a team game is. So Florida State, in by every measure of that, deserves to be in the playoff. I just don't see them beating any of those teams that we talked about. Okay. I don't so, see it. Not, not with a back of quarterback. I don't see that happening. So that, to me, is the dilemma. And that, to me, is why... I understand why Florida State should be in, yeah. but I start talking myself into Michigan, Washington, Alabama, and Texas as well. Okay. But do you... Th okay, so if the, the committee is tasked with picking the best four, you don't believe the combination of resume and recent performance is enough for Florida State. You don't believe that's... Look, you're not on the committee. You're not in charge of picking the the priorities that the committee holds when selecting these teams. And so this is just in your subjective heart, what you yeah, want the playoffs so subjectively, to be. Subjectively, subjectively, my struggle is I don't think Florida State, in its present form, yeah. defense and all, yeah. but given their struggles now on offense, their challenges on offense by, by no fault of their own through injury, right. which sucks. I mean, this whole thing sucks. Yeah. And I've been rooting for Florida State this year, so I'd, I would like to see them in. I would like right. to see them have an opportunity to prove that they are more than just this weird quarterback situation that they find themselves in. So I'm right. I don't want to dunk on Florida state. I, I really like what they have done this season. Yeah. I just have serious doubts that they're going to be able to contend with, you know, a, a true baller of a defense like Michigan. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I just don't see it. I don't see that, that, that happening. So for me, that's, that's sort of where I struggle with this. Here, and here's why I would be inclined to put Bama or Texas in over them. Here, here's the other side of this, which I think is more aligned with your thinking on this issue, is Florida State earned an ACC championship. 
it is not their God-given right to be in the playoff because they went undefeated. Like, if the playoff is trying to yell from the mountaintops that this is nuanced and this is about strength of performance and they're taking in a number of different factors and record and head-to-head are enormous factors, but they're not everything. We've seen an undefeated team in make the playoff but be seated behind a team with a loss. I think it was Oregon was ahead with one loss. A 12-1 and Oregon team was ahead of a 13-0 and Florida State team in that first playoff. Now, the the structure of the 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 committee and what they weigh has changed over time, but there is precedent for not just rubber stamping an undefeated conference champion to whatever extent it's seating is different than actually getting a berth. but Florida state earned an ACC championship beyond that. There's nothing. I don't believe in the playoff bylaws that say any undefeated power conference team is automatically in. Right. Right. They couldn't do that. Right. Cause the hypothetically we could have five in the current system. So, I don't think Florida State necessarily has that God-given ability. <laughs> I don't know. That's that's a pretty dramatic term. I understand that they should automatically be in because they went undefeated. Uh, being undefeated right. is hard. So I, I understand both points of view. I think the best possible entertainment product includes Alabama and not Florida State because quarterback is too important and... I am not a believer in Tate Rodemaker on the same level that I'm a believer in Jalen Milrow, J.J. McCarthy, Quinn Ewers, um, any any of these quarterbacks in this conversation. So, it, yeah, it I is it I'm, is an impossible conversation. It is truly impossible. So, so what? So you're on the committee. Your official vote and seating is what? Uh, I would put. I mean, I might be inclined to put Washington one, Dan. To be honest with you, because <laughs> of Michigan's this- performance tonight. Yeah. And beating a top five-ish I, team twice? I, I probably go Michigan one. I probably go Washington two. Um, I think I put, even though Texas beat Alabama, I think I put Alabama three and I put Texas four. And I put Florida Oh, State I would five. put Texas won their conference and beat Alabama. I don't care. I don't care. So your, your think, line of I thinking, think, I'm putting words in your mouth here. Again. I think okay. if they play again, Alabama wins. Okay, so I'm putting – well, look, I thought that about Oregon, Ty, and nobody was more wrong than I on Friday night. Um, the line of thinking is that uh, Texas in losing to Oklahoma might be worse than Alabama in losing to Texas, weirdly. That Very if you're comparing weirdly. losses, <laughs> Alabama has the better loss. Texas has arguably the better win now that Alabama has become its full-fledged zombie Alabama feasting on the brains of all who come – before it, I mean, after it's, losing to Texas, it, it was a wise investment by Texas to get in early on beating Alabama when Alabama had its quarterback strife. And I'm not blaming that for this, but it was a different Alabama team. It frankly was a different Alabama team. This version see, of Alabama is better. It was literally last week that Alabama needed a miracle to beat Auburn. I know, I know. Weird rivalry stuff, man. It's look seven days. It is. It is very, very fitting. That in this era of college football where everything is about to change in yeah. a tectonic way, mm-hmm. the playoff system is going to be expanded. We've got one whole conference that is going to be dissolved. Mm-hmm. We've got, uh, you know, all of these vast changes that are happening around the sport. I guess you could say it's very fitting that we have this incredible debate that needs to take place among the selection committee. I would not want to be on that selection committee Poor Boom Shakalaka Corrigan is going to be out there tomorrow. It's going to be like the freaking Red Wedding in Game of Thrones with him out there having to answer questions and justify who they decide they're going to put in. I don't I don't envy that position being the sacrificial lamb on behalf of that committee. Uh, but we'll find out at noon Eastern time. As you said, we'll we'll go live on YouTube and talk it through. And then we'll give a full breakdown, of course, on the Tuesday podcast episode that we put out, not just of the college football playoff rankings, but of all the bowl rankings. By the way, everybody who is listening to this show right now, yeah. get in on our bowl confidence pool. We call it Winter yes. Wonders. I'm not going to drone on about it now because we have more important things to discuss, but it is free. It is open to the public. Go to playwinterwonders.com. That'll take you right on over to the bowl pool page. You just got to sign up. It's confidence pool. We'll talk much more about it. Prizes are awarded to the top 11 players dan so a vast array of prizes to give out it's the most we've ever had play play winter, winter wonders. wonders.com play winter wonders.com 
Um, I Did you would... notice as a community how quickly we moved past Georgia? <laughs> Is well, that weird at all to you? I, I wanted to go there with it next. Okay. okay? And that's, that's sort of my point here because – it is so weird that the two-time defending national champion has quickly become an afterthought by virtue of this loss. It was a moment ago, it feels like a moment ago, that we were penciling them into this college football playoff despite the fact that they were still less than a touchdown favorite. Um, I think it's hard to put Georgia in this conversation by virtue of their schedule. I really like Georgia. <laughs> I really like Georgia as a football team. I think they're probably going to end up playing somebody like a Louisville or whoever in the orange bowl, they will win that game. Whoever they play, they will win. I'm sure comfortably. Um, but it does feel a bit dirty almost that we've moved on so quickly from it. Doesn't it? It's weird. It's, they were it's kind of the wire, wire, wire to wire. Number one. Although I think Ohio state was at number one for a couple of weeks when the playoff rankings started coming out, Georgia goes 12 and zero. they handle an Ole Miss team that we know is pr at least pretty good. They beat Mizzou beat Tennessee, and you're right about the scheduling in the non-conference, and that is a difference with Alabama because you have to also credit Alabama, even in a losing effort, for scheduling that game. Um, and it's a home-and-home -home version as well, going to Austin last year, I believe, and then uh, hosting Texas this year, where Georgia has the Oklahoma game get canceled. So that is part of it when Oklahoma joins the conference. But ultimately, you look at the actual resume, and this is Georgia's schedule. And I saw Kirby after the game sort of – uh, in an exasperated manner, say, well, they say they want the best teams. We're clearly one of the best teams um, after losing, which is a tough, tough break to, to be tough, in that position. That's a tough spot, Kirby. Yeah. Um, so I just, I wonder that, like, is in your mind, and this is not how the committee necessarily evaluates it. This is just an exercise in conversation between the two of us. Like, is Georgia one of the actual four best teams in the sport? Like, I think Georgia's definitely better than the version of Florida State we have on our hands. I don't think that's better. not a controversial thing to say. That's not controversial. No. No. I mean, I think, I think, I almost think that Michigan and Georgia are two sides of the same coin. Right. They feel very, very similar to me. They did last year. Uh, and again, it's, it's a similar play style. I, I think Georgia has clearly more pop on offense, ceiling wise, than Michigan, but. I, I agree just philosophically. I think you're philosophically right. there's there's a lot of overlap there. Yeah. Um obviously lost to Alabama today, but you know, you put them up against Washington. That's an interesting matchup in terms of defense against offense. Um, you know, with how Washington controlled the line of scrimmage against Oregon, they I think they proved that they can win against a team that we think is physical sure. anyway. So maybe they're closer in a matchup like that, but I, I still think Georgia would probably be favored. Georgia would be favored against most of these teams. Yeah. But even again, if the game we're played tomorrow. They again the what point does that mean? Don't, what does that the mean? Point spreads don't mean anything right. in, in this universe. But uh yeah, it's it's an interesting conversation to be had. And I, I would still probably be inclined to take Georgia if you put them on a neutral field against any of these teams that we're that we're discussing. Well, not Alabama, probably. Not Alabama. They anymore. they did enough to prove it today. Even though it was a tight game and maybe that's a fifty fifty game, you play that game a hundred times. Um, yeah, it's interesting to me. I think there is an eye test element to Georgia, even though you can say like the SEC was overrated this year, their schedule didn't showcase a ton, you know, not having, you know, for instance, LSU this year, that would have gone a long way to showing us what Georgia is or isn't. And that's just the way the schedule worked out. Um, I'm okay with not having Georgia in this playoff. I really am. And so Look, this was in effect a play in game. It was. This was in effect a playing game, and you know, next year we probably won't have this discussion. Next year, the conversation will be whether or not these games matter, whether or yeah. not they've lost meaning. They'll be playing for seeding and not necessarily qualification. So it'll be a different world next year as it stands right now. It, if these are in fact playoff games, if they are in fact supposed to mean something for the for the postseason, then um, look, football's a weird sport. Sometimes the teams that we think are the best, some teams. Sometimes the teams that Vegas says would win 79 times out of 100 don't win, and they don't move on. Just watch the NFL. It happens every year. Right. And that's so, okay. It's okay. That's, that's tournament football. That's tournament anything. And so, yeah, I for as good of a season as I think Georgia had, for as good of a team and for as talented as they are, I, if you're going to put anybody in from the SEC, it's Alabama, and it's certainly not two teams. It's not two SEC teams this year, regardless Man. of what Greg Sankey has to say. And so BCS era, we're just getting Michigan-Washington and calling it a day? I guess.
It would wow. almost be a crime. It would be a crime, wouldn't it? It would be a crime to who? To whom? To anybody outside of Michigan or Washington. Yeah. Well, they went undefeated. I guess it's only Florida State, but it's easier to leave Florida State out. If you're comparing that undefeated team, you have a 2000... I hope I get the year right here. Was it a 2004 situation where Auburn was left out undefeated? I, I don't know the year. Doesn't With matter. Jason Campbell, I believe. Point taken. Um, Point taken. But yeah, yeah that, that would have been an easy an easy out-ish given Jordan Travis's injury. So my if I were a voting member of the committee and in my core, in my marrow, I was tasked with finding the the four teams that I feel like would most accurately give me the opportunity to find the best team. It, it would leave out Tate Rodemaker in Florida State. If that's the, the true core of what you're finding, you leave out Florida State, you include Oregon, you include Louisville. No, um, it's <laughs> I'm going to go Washington, Michigan. No, I'm going to go Michigan, then Washington. I'm going to go Michigan, Washington, Texas, Alabama. Okay. And again, I don't think Texas is undeniable. I watched that Houston game. I watched that TCU game. They're not undeniable, which is kind of a great thing about this year. That none of the, you know, Washington has their squeakers. Michigan has their weird end to the season. Uh, and they have the Harbaugh thing. They have obviously the sign stealing allegations hovering over the program. Alabama has some squeakers. And that makes the year kind of incredible we that you don't have an undeniable LSU 2019 Georgia from the past couple of years. That's great. We we did not have the level of chaos that we thought we might have given. Remember at the start of the year, all the new quarterbacks. Sure. There's a lot of uncertainty among, especially in the SEC, right? Uh, new, new starting quarterbacks. What is that going to mean? We did not have quite the level of chaos that I think we, we thought yeah. we might have, but what we ended up with we, uh, was essentially a panel of like, seven to eight top teams, none right. of which are bulletproof. And that in and of itself was a change as compared to previous where years where we thought we could pencil in Georgia, who are Alabama, even in years past. Yeah. Um, you, you couldn't really pencil anybody in maybe outside of Michigan. Michigan was kind of like, you know, the solid team throughout the course of the season, despite all the other stuff that went on with them. Um, they will have another opportunity, obviously to prove their, their medal here in the college football playoff, the Michigan Wolverines. Uh, again, as we said, Tune in live on YouTube. If you're watching this, make sure you hit subscribe. Make sure you set the notification bell because after those playoff announcements are made, noon Eastern time on Sunday, Dan and I are going to go live. And we're going to talk it out. We'll take comments. We'll we'll do the whole nine yards. We'll make a little production out of it. Yeah. Because my hunch is that a lot of people are going to have a lot of things to say. So (laughs) a lot of emotions. All are welcome. We would encourage everybody to stop on back. And, uh, and share their viewpoint. We'll try to take some questions and uh, incorporate as much of the community feedback as we can. Agree. Any, any closing thought? I mean, look, we had, there were other games. On there were weekend. other games, and I wanted to give a shout-out to our, to our brothers and sisters over at the G5 because it was a great weekend of games on the Group of Five level as sure. well. I mean, for as much as we talk about the playoff, for as much as we talk about um, you know, the uncertainty there— there, there is some uncertainty around which of the G5 teams is going to get the New Year's Six Bowl slot True. because Tulane lost, which means that either Liberty, 13-0 and Liberty, which had like maybe the worst schedule of any team yeah. in the, any team in FBS, uh, Liberty or SMU is going to end up getting that bowl berth. Um, Liberty won on Friday night, and it was a good game. It was 49-35, the Conference USA Championship game over New Mexico State. It No defense. There was no No. defense in this game. It was close until the final quarter, but absolute pinball stats. 712 yards for Liberty, 393 on the ground for the Flames, 499 in total yardage for New Mexico State. Then you had the interesting circumstance of Diego Pavia, the quarterback for New Mexico State, who didn't practice during the week because of a shoulder injury, but did play in this game through three touchdowns and ran for a score before getting hurt again and not returning. Um, Just a crazy crazy offensive game as Liberty pulls away late in the fourth quarter. They become the first team from the state of Virginia to win 13 games. Interestingly, interestingly enough in a college football season. So Liberty has a claim to that new Year's six throne. Uh, Also SMU SMU knocked off Tulane in the American championship 26 to 14 in what I would call a big boy win. Yeah. Big boy win because they lost Preston stone. And they had to plug in Kevin Jennings, their backup quarterback. Um, a very low-key Florida State situation here. 
Uh, Kevin Jennings steps in through two picks, but his ability to extend plays in this American championship was really exciting. He accounts for 266 total yards. Definitely a lot of promise there uh, at the quarterback spot. The story, though, was the SMU defense. A- SMU came into this game up against Tulane squad that simply had been there before. Yeah. Tulane's a known quantity in college football circles. They sacked Michael Pratt seven times, and they held Tulane to two of, five, two of 15 excuse me, on third downs. So SMU came in with a very, very solid defense, even though previous versions of SMU were known more for offense. This is a very, very good defensive football team, and it showed in this matchup. 26-14 to 14 was your final over Tulane. So I, one of those two teams is going to go and play one of the other teams that we just got done discussing because of the way the New Year's Six is set up. Um, the other action on the G5 level, we have Miami of Ohio over Toledo, 23 to 14. I predicted that Toledo was going to win this game, 24 to 13. So yeah, it was really close on the score. I just got the, got the eventual winner wrong. Um, Miami completed six passes in total, six of 16, but ran for close to 200 yards. This was a bizarre game. This was a very bizarre game game it was yeah Miami jumped out yeah defined by special teams by defense ultimately by a Jason Candle Toledo team that frankly looked out coached and underprepared agree Miami just Miami just wanted it more it was like kick blocks and block kicks and kick returns and that sort of thing all of that stuff that Miami needed to win a game like this they got whether Daquan Finn and some crazy plays that he was in the midst of making yeah so that was crazy in and of itself a nice win for Miami to win the Mac. The Mountain West is its own storyline altogether because Boise ends up winning this thing 44 to 20. Now, it was a home game for UNLV. They played at Allegiant Stadium in, in Las Vegas. The first half was nuts. Like mm-hmm. everything in this game went for a touchdown in the first half. Boise State, though, winning this a few weeks after firing its coach is kind of wild it's, it's kind unprecedented of wild they, yeah it's unprecedented it's kind of wild that they fired him in the first place then how they got into this game via computer rankings then the showing that they put forth after losing the coach this was Taylor green's best game in his career he looked awesome ashton Ginty, uh, uh just dude caliber runs i think he was a, one of our dudes we'll get to that here momentarily yeah. um boys just kicked their ass they just straight up kicked their ass Went to Las Vegas. They kicked their ass. They've been there before. They showed that they've been there before. You said that the was A-word really there twice, Ty. Absolutely. <laughs> and then last but certainly not least, we can talk about what Troy did in the Sun Belt game. 49-23 to 23 was the final. That score is a little bit misleading because this was 28 or 21, excuse me, to 17 going into the fourth quarter. Troy scored 28 points in the fourth quarter. They just poured it on. They just played bully ball. Throughout the second half, they beat App State's brains in. They rushed for 271 on the ground. Kamani Vidal, their running back, maybe a possible dude nominee here, had 270, 233 on the ground of that 271. And Troy, Troy puts the capper on a really nice season in the Sun Belt. So kudos to all of those G5 teams on their victories. We'll see where things stack up as it relates to bowl season. Agree. On all counts. If you are listening again, please make sure you hit subscribe. Please make sure you follow the podcast. I wanted to give a shout out to someone named Unserious Offense who left us a review oh. out on Apple. Five stars said the original, the original college football podcast is still the best. Boom. Despite the changing environment, Dan and Ty do a magnificent job staying on top of everything that's going on in and around the sport. Most importantly, remain independent thinkers who don't just parrot. <laughs> Hot takes of the day. Thank you, Unserious Offense. We appreciate that. Encourage you to go and leave a ranking and review on your own. Agree. Absolutely agree. You want to get into some dudes? Some players are good. Some are great. And some are just dudes. Welcome to Dude Alert, presented by Pristine Auction. Each and every reaction show and... um. I don't know. We're going to keep doing dudes because we like doing this dude segment. <laughs> yeah. We give out the gold, the silver, and the bronze dude goblet presented by our good friends over at Pristine Auction. What do you got for me this week, Dan? All right. My bronze is, was it uh, Tatum Bethune? 
<laughs> Tatum Bethune, Florida State, almost comes up with an interception in the end zone and then comes up with an interception in the end zone after I believe Florida State has their punter tackled on a great punt block situation. Louisville looking to capitalize uh, with a tiny little field and Florida State's defense comes up big in that moment. Uh, the silver goblet I'm going to give to uh, Dylan Johnson of Washington. Oh, Just man. absolute dude and... As good as we've seen and great as we've seen Washington through the air play all year, most of the season, uh, and they were there, you know, Michael Penix to Jalen McMillan and Roma Dunze. It really was what Washington was able to do on the ground. 10 of 15 on third downs. Great in the red zone. Dylan Johnson, uh, an absolute warrior there. Uh, and then the, the golden dude of the week, Quinn Ewers, for absolutely having his best game. It's Oklahoma State, but having his best game when they absolutely needed it. The running game really wasn't there, by and large. Keelan Robinson got loose for a couple big plays, but this wasn't a, a balanced Texas attack in that the running game was complementing uh, Quinn Ewers for four quarters. It was A.D. Mitchell downfield. I saw Xavier Worthy goes down. I think it's an ankle injury. Yeah. But J.T. Sanders steps up, and Quinn Ewers underrated in his and he did it against Alabama earlier in the year throws a beautiful Tecmo Super Bowl ball leaves the top of the screen dips back in throws yeah. a big impressive arcing deep ball that sort of comes into the cradle the rainmaker he throws it yeah it and is it is he a had, Tecmo he had Super a couple bowl. of beauties today for Texas and uh really stepped up not that Texas was likely going to be playing a close game I know I picked Oklahoma State to cover because of Gundy pixie dust against Texas, but he was just, he, he was, this is my word of the day. He was undeniable for the Longhorns. Yeah. I want to give an honorable dude mention to, I believe his name was Ryan Georgia. At least that's how it sounded on the broadcast okay. from the university of Pennsylvania who needed to go into double overtime to win his tuition throw in the big 12 game. <laughs> now the tuition throw Get that is paper. The tuition throw is one of our favorite aspects of yeah college football championship week they do more of them now than ever before the chess pass of course is a controversial move uh i have never seen one before that went into what they called the shootout mode essentially a double overtime tiebreaker Jeez. where they had to alternate back and forth they didn't move them back they didn't make them kick extra points they didn't i wanted them any to run the 40 and just have somebody go down with a hammy at 28 yards <laughs> Down goes Mike. <laughs> Whatever. I, would, yeah. I would love to see a different spin on the tiebreaker. Yeah. I've never, I can't remember any of them ever going that deep into this thing, but Ryan from the university of Pennsylvania emerged as the uh, tuition throw winner in the big 12. Just having to do like a sobriety test where they're like touching their nose on the 20 yard line. They have to do the it alphabet. next time playing yeah. dizzy bat first. And yeah. then yeah, something like that. But uh, maybe Dr. Pepper can work on the tiebreaker methodology. Nonetheless, congratulations to that guy for winning a hundred grand. Throw. I think both. both Sorry, of I was going to say, actually, speak with your chest, throw with your chest, get that paper, do what you got to do. Both of them ended up getting the hundred grand. Which I saw was that. A nice gesture from from Dr. Pepper. Um, again, those are your dude alerts presented by our good friends over at Pristine Auction, the ultimate destination for sports signed memorabilia means you can get signed gear from dudes playing for all your favorite teams. Yeah, so, or just, former, former dudes. Or former yeah. former dudes. I mean, we've used the example before of like Justin Herbert, mm -hmm. Bryce Young, go out, type your favorite team in, whatever you're into, whatever you're into, they got it. Bid start at one buck. Head on out to pristineauction.com. Use the code SOLID for $10 off your very first win. No brainer. Absolute no brainer. So look, this conversation is going to rage long after the final bell of this podcast. We appreciate everybody downloading, supporting what we do. Make sure you hit subscribe. Make sure you hit follow. As we said, again, we'll be going live shortly after the playoff rankings are officially announced on our YouTube channel. We would encourage everybody to stop by, give their commentary, offer their feedback, et cetera, et cetera. It will certainly be a lively discussion we would also encourage everybody who is listening to go on out to playwinterwonders.com. That'll get you in our bowl confidence pool. It is free to play. The top 11 folks get prizes. More to come on that, but get on out there, sign up, tell your friends and family. If you run a bowl pool, just get in ours. More than welcome. Play in the Winter Wonders Bowl Pool. Agree. Dan, we need to get some sleep because it's going to be a very, very busy day tomorrow. All right. I cannot wait for tomorrow. So it'll be around what? One-ish Eastern? 
when we're going to go live on YouTube? We'll schedule it one Eastern, yeah. Okay, great. Can't wait. For that guy over there, my good friend Dan Rubenstein for myself, Ty Hildenbrandt. Appreciate everybody stopping by, listening to the show, supporting what we do. Leave those rankings. Leave those reviews. We'll talk to you all 1 p.m. Sunday afternoon. Stay solid. Peace.